excited to be here today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about calm, which is kind of ironic because that's like the last thing I'm feeling right now. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity just to give like a big heartfelt thank you to Jane for uniting all of us here today. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Jane now for the last little while, and what inspires me most about her is her endless passion for the field of ECB. And I think it is so reassuring and so encouraging to know that there is somebody who is constantly rooting for us. Because when there is somebody who's advocating for us, then we know that there's actually somebody who's advocating for who we care most about, which are the children in our lives. So today I'm here to explore the concept and the power of calm with you, and to just kind of figure out how we might achieve it in the midst of all the chaos that many of us have succumbed to in our modern world today. Um, before we go into that though, um, I thought I would share a story with you about my first encounter with Tom. <coughs> this was basically the first recollection I have uh, when I was younger. So I was about nine or ten years old at the time, and my mother and I, as we so often did, we had gotten into an argument with one another. Uh, because I wanted to go to my friend's house for a sleepover, and she said, no. <laughs> and her exact words were, as long as you live in this house, you are not allowed to go. And uh, I thought, well, that can be rearranged. <laughs> so uh, I took a mini suitcase, I remember filling it up with all my favorite toys, my favorite snacks, and then I snuck out the back door and left through the side of the house. And I was I was walking towards uh, Queen Elizabeth Park at the time because we lived near there. And uh, I remember walking really fast at first and then slowing down as I got further and further away. Um, as my time of solitude increased, uh, I remember my feelings of anger and frustration slowly dissipating. Um, I remember slowing down and just feeling this wind kind of brush up against my face. And I actually remember stopping, closing my eyes, and just feeling that coolness and the freshness of the wind against me. And then I remember I opened my eyes and I thought, wow, the sky is so beautiful. Like, what a beautiful, calming blue. And just above my head, there was this tree branch, and it was rustling in the wind. And I remember becoming aware of these little baby leaves that were growing off of it. And thinking how strong the stems were, keeping its leaf rooted to that tree branch and keeping it rooted to its home, even in the wind. And so in that moment, I wasn't angry anymore. I was just there in the present moment, feeling calm. And calm gave me a chance to think about my actions without being overridden by emotion. Needless to say, I did not successfully run away from home. <laughs> um, shortly after that moment, I did go back home. And no, I did not get to go on my sleepover. Uh, in fact, I got into even more trouble for <laughs> running away. <laughs> That's another story for another day. <coughs> what I want to emphasize, though, is that it was that moment of calm that was truly eye-opening for me. And I have been chasing that same moment of calm in my adult life ever since it's become overstuffed, overwhelmed, and just incredibly stressed. And I'm sure many of you can relate to and understand the toxicity of stress mm -hmm. and how much of it we have in our modern world. So specifically, our industry itself, it's just so incredibly taxed right now. And it's really easy to see. Like, just go onto the Facebook groups and you can look in the ECE groups and you'll see what people are saying. We are struggling for proper recognition and appreciation for the work that we do in this field. We are struggling for fair compensation and we're in, like, going through financial hardships. We are struggling with government policies that are continuously being rolled out without our consult and making it really difficult to make operating decisions and they're scary to navigate through. So, and on top of all of that, we still go above and beyond the call of duty to meet the needs of all the children and all the families because we don't know how to do any less than that. 
we are ECEs. We are teachers, as I said earlier. <laughs> and it's no wonder so many of us are you know, feeling burnout or leaving this field altogether. So more than ever, the need for us to develop a relationship with calm is needed. So now I recognize that all of us handle stress in different ways. Some of us distract ourselves. Some of us uh, turn to our friends or family. Uh, some turn to food or drinks to de-stress. I myself, I, uh, I turn to TV. <laughs> and my husband, who's here, who often asks me why I watch so much TV, and I tell him, honey, it's it's my escape. <laughs> Don't bother me about this. <laughs> While these strategies may provide a band-aid solution to our problems, they don't actually help us handle stress itself. So the power of calm, though, if fostered in the right way, can actually give us this ability. Tamara Levitt, who is head of the Mindfulness and Meditation of the Calm app, she explains that calm allows us to handle stress because it gives us something really powerful. It gives us Choice. And the best way that I can kind of explain this to you guys is with an example. So when something upsets us, like for example, a child for that day just isn't listening to anything that we're saying to them on that particular day, or the licensing officer comes in and writes us up for something that we don't think it's really fair to be written up on, or a parent complains that their child's clothes are so dirty at the end of the day, um, it's really easy for us to become reactive. And we get caught up in our emotions and respond in ways that could ultimately hurt ourselves and others. So for myself, when things like that happen, I really try to like, fix it as fast as I can because I really want to get rid of that feeling of tension. And when I do that, though, I often pay the price later on because I know I didn't think the entire thing like, thoroughly. And this is what we do as humans. We react when we experience intense negative emotions, and only after we have reacted do we wish we had taken the time to pause and slow down so that we could have responded more skillfully and thoughtfully to the situation. We break down the sequence of what happens um, from first you your stimulus, and then you've got your emotions, and then you have a reaction. You'll notice there's a tiny window Right here. <laughs> <laughs> this tiny window of space often gets overlooked because we are in such a hurry to react. But what happens when we slow down and when we calm down? Like, what if we were to pause at this window and open its curtains so that we could see things more clearly? We would see that it is here that we have choice. I know it's really small, sorry. Small <laughs> choice. <laughs> between emotion and reaction, we can actually choose to act rather than react. <coughs> and the more we practice being aware of this space and learning how to be with all of our emotions without reacting, the better we can be at responding to situations with thought, care, and compassion, and the better we can be at handling stress. So how then can we be more mindful versus Mindless. Mm, it's a hard question, right? <laughs> Mindfulness is our key to accessing calm and to finding that window of space between emotion and reaction. <coughs> Buddhist monk and peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh, who I like to idolize, <laughs> is the leader in mindfulness, and he defines it as a kind of energy that helps us to be fully present in the here and the now aware of what is going on in our body, in our feelings, in our mind, and in the world, so that we can get in touch with the wonders of life that can nourish and heal us. Think about that for a second. When was the last time any of us here were in a state of true mindfulness? When was the last time you paused and took a moment for yourself and thought, okay, my body is like, I'm not feeling pretty tense right now, and I'm pretty upset. Maybe I should pause, calm myself down before I respond. We don't often do that because it's not easy. I mean, in fact, it's really
really, really hard to do. And if you think about it, we are constantly practicing, reacting to situations on a daily basis that really it's become a habit for us now. And we all know how difficult it is to break a habit. So what can we do? How can we practice being more mindful in the things that we do? And what does it mean when someone says to walk mindfully, to eat mindfully, to listen mindfully? How can we practice this? Mindfulness leaders and advocates of a mindfulness does meditation. <laughs> and I've always kind of thought meditation was something rooted in Buddhist tradition. And what my journey to calm has taught me is that while it may be rooted in religion, it has been reframed over the years now in a much more secular way, so that it's way more accessible for people like us to access it. Um, there's a wealth of research in the scientific, scientific community now that demonstrates the profound health benefits that for those who practice it daily, and that it's not just for monks. Now, when I first tried meditation on my own with, without anything, you know, I did everything it was stereotyped to be. I sat down, I crossed my legs, I had my back up straight, I had my fingers like this, I closed my eyes, and I like tried to clear my head. And, well, what happened was, I fell asleep. <laughs> um, but what I'm really trying to say is that it takes a lot of practice, like anything, to become good at meditating. Thich Nhat Hanh, he explains that when done properly, meditation allows us to come back to our body, to recognize the tension and suffering which is present in it, and be 